Good morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, today, the Greenville Police Department announces it now knows the identity of the person responsible mm -hmm. for the brutal murder of 28-year-old mm -hmm. Genevieve mm -hmm. Jenny Zitricki on or about April 4th of 1990. More than 28 years ago now, Jenny was a resident of Hidden Lake Apartments, now known as Lakeside Place Apartments, located along Villa Road. She was young, active, well-liked in her circles of colleagues and friends, often the life of the party. During the late night, early morning hours of April 4th and 5th of 1990, an intruder entered her apartment by prying open the sliding glass door. He attacked her as she slept, bludgeoned her, strangled her, and sexually assaulted her. In the days and weeks that followed, investigators worked tirelessly to identify the person or persons responsible. These efforts included talking with neighbors, conducting interviews, following up on numerous tips, leads, and analyzing many pieces of physical evidence. Days turned into weeks, weeks to months, months to years. Despite our best efforts, this case went cold. Technologies to assess criminal evidence have evolved dramatically over the past few decades. In 2005, evidence collected from the murder scene was given to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's DNA lab for the purposes of developing a DNA profile. This proved successful and the profile was entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system commonly referred to as CODIS. In 2006, the Greenville Police Department was notified that the DNA profile submitted from Jenny's case matched a DNA profile from another brutal double murder occurring in 1998 in Portageville, Missouri. Though a major development, this evidence did not provide the needed information to identify the murderer as the DNA profile was from an unidentified unknown male. In 2009, Jenny's case was featured on America's Most Wanted. Investigators had hoped that national exposure would help bring the murderer to justice by divulging specific, never-released details about Jenny's case. Though many more tips followed, critical information continued to elude us, and the case again went cold. In May 2017, the Greenville Police Department was alerted to another CODIS match. This profile was collected from a sexual assault victim in Memphis, Tennessee in 1997. It was processed for DNA in 2017. Again, this was a match without a known offender identification. Investigators from multiple agencies collaborated to further their investigations. Suspect identification efforts provided, produced no results. On July 3rd of this year, in an effort to produce a breakthrough, investigators from Memphis, Tennessee, Missouri State Highway Patrol, New Madrid Sheriff's Department, and the Greenville Police Department participated in a conference call with Parabon Nanolabs, a genealogy research company in Reston, Virginia. Following consultation with the company's representatives, investigators from all agencies decided to submit DNA profiles for comparative DNA analyses. Just as Parabon Nanolabs had done in other high-profile cases, we had hoped that they could help identify the murderer linked to cases in each of our jurisdictions. On August 23rd of this year, investigators received the findings from Parabon. Based on the preponderance of genealogical, genetic, and circumstantial evidence, analysts concluded the identity of a man highly likely to be the suspect. With this information, investigators contacted the family of the suspect and obtained consensual buckle swabs for further analysis. These swabs were submitted to South Carolina, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's DNA lab. The results indicated that these family members were directly related to the suspect 
a man who committed suicide during a police encounter in Kennett, Missouri in 1999 at the age of 40. On September 27th, in an effort funded by the Greenville Police Department, investigators exhumed the body of the deceased suspect in Paragould, Arkansas. The purpose of the exhumation was to obtain DNA directly from the body and compare this profile with the profile from the multiple unsolved murders and sexual assaults. The subsequent analysis by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's DNA lab confirmed the work of Parabon Nano Labs. The unknown DNA profile collected from Jenny's body and from all the others belonged to the deceased subject, now confirmed to be Robert Eugene Brashers, a 40-year-old man from Paragold, Arkansas. Robert Brashers lived the majority of his life in Huntsville, Alabama, but lived in Paragold, Arkansas after being released from prison in 1997. While we are indebted to his family for assisting us and consenting to the DNA analysis, we now know that Robert Brashers was a violent serial rapist and murderer. His criminal history tells the story of a vicious, brutal murderer. In 1986, Brashers was convicted for beating and shooting a woman in Port St. Lucie, Florida. For this, he served three and a half years in prison and was released on May 4, 1989. In April of 1990, Brashers brutally raped and murdered Z Jenny Zetricki here in Greenville, and until now, an unsolved crime. In 1992, Brashers was arrested in Cobb County, Georgia, for possession of a stolen pistol and possession of a stolen vehicle. At the time of his arrest, he had a scanner, a police coat or jacket, burglary tools, and a fake Tennessee license. He again was sentenced to prison and was released on February 17, 1997. On March 11, 1997, Brashers entered a home in Memphis, Tennessee, and sexually assaulted a 14-year-old female visiting with friends. Brashers fled the home, and until now, this case was unsolved. On March 28, 1998, Brashers brutally murdered Sherry Shearer and her 12-year-old daughter, Megan. He shot them multiple times. Megan was also sexually assaulted. Until now, this case was unsolved. Later that same day, March 28, 1998, Brashers attempted to force his way into a home in Dyersburg, Tennessee. The 25-year-old mother, home with a small child, fought with Brashers and was shot in the doorway of her home. She survived and provided a description to police. The projectile retrieved from her body was also later linked to the Shearer murders. Until now, that case was unsolved. On April 12, 1998, Brashers was arrested as he attempted to break into a single woman's home for whom he had previously done handyman work. Brasher had cut the phone lines to the home, was armed with a firearm, had a video camera, and possessed other tools. He was released from custody the following day. On January 13, 1999, officers located a vehicle displaying a stolen tag in a parking lot of Super 8 Motel, of a Super 8 Motel in Kennett, Missouri. Officers were directed to a room occupied by Brashers and located him hiding under a bed armed with a firearm. After four hours of police hostage negotiations, Brashers released the other room occupants who were his wife and children, and then shot himself. He died six days later on January 19, 1999. So today is a bittersweet moment in that we have finally been able to bring closure to the family of Jenny Zetricki.
Time has enhanced technologies and organizations like Parabon, Nanolabs, SLED, and the FBI have filled that space with competent teams who help us revisit unsolved crimes and actually solve them. Generations of detectives who worked Jenny's murder investigation and gave all they had to solve it, including some who have returned in their retirements to continue this important work, are able to see this case now closed. None of these efforts can bring Jenny back. We can only hope that this day brings peace to her soul, peace to her family, and honor to her memory. At this time, I'd like to invite Jenny's brother, Philip, to the podium to tell us about Jenny, how this tragedy has impacted his family all these years. Thank you for being here, Philip, and for sharing your memories with us. Twenty-eight years. Twenty-eight years. It's been a long time. It's been time enough for trails to go cold, for memories to fade, and for connections to fray and sever. It's almost been time enough to give up hope. But the men and women of this outstanding organization, in concert, professionals from other far-flung jurisdictions never gave up. They never wavered. They never forgot their promise. The intersection of their dedication and the recent advances of DNA technology and data science have paid a huge dividend with this resolution. On behalf of Jenny's family, my mother Rosemary, our dear departed father Ed, and all of our relatives across the country, we thank you for your persistence, your teamwork, and your zeal to succeed. You have traveled the long road and reached the goal. And words alone cannot express our appreciation. Our hearts also go out to the family and friends of the other victims. We pray that you find similar solace in the conclusion, and may God bless you all. It's been 28 years since Jenny was taken from us. The intervening years have brought the painful sorrow of loss and the longing for what could have been. But we do well to remember her in life. She was a force of nature, a firecracker, a bundle of infectious energy, an intelligent, vibrant, caring human being, all whose lives she touched, near and far, then and now, should keep her in their hearts, not as she left, but as she lived. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Philip. Before we take questions, I'd like to speak to direct, directly to the other families who still seek answers for the loved ones that they've lost. We know that each day without your loved one is incredibly difficult and that you cannot truly rest until you know why your loved one was taken and who was responsible. There are many men, men and women in this room that have ownership to that cause, to seek answers to those questions and to bring responsible people to justice, no matter how long it takes. A son, a daughter, a parent, a spouse, an aunt, or an uncle, a cousin or a friend, no matter their background or social status, your loved one matters to you very much. And each of them matters to us very much as well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I will invite uh, our team up here, includes uh, 
the detectives who have investigated it uh, initially closed it. Philip, uh, our our SLED contacts uh, here as well. You have their names, but uh, we'll entertain any questions that you have uh, and uh, try to give you the answers you seek. Thank you. So that we can take the Could there be other cold cases that are tied to this man, to Brashers, do you, do you think? So it is entirely possible that there could be other cold cases. Uh, there could be sexual assaults. Generally speaking, uh, most agencies submit uh, their, their DNA samples uh, to their state labs or local labs. Uh, ultimately, those DNA profiles, if there are profiles extracted uh, from the samples that are sent, are entered up through the state into the FBI CODIS uh, inventory or database. And that what would then happen is that is constantly scanning uh, the entire population of profiles for matches. So uh, it is unlikely that there's a murder unless there's new evidence that is detected and tested in a murder such as a cold case which is what we continually look at as technology changes with our cold cases so it is possible but it would it would be because the there were there was no prior DNA profile extracted from evidence in, in those cases uh, where it's more likely to uh, show up are through untaste, untested uh, rape kits uh, and there are a number of agencies throughout uh, the United States that are working to relieve those backlogs uh, and get those tested. And so we might, cont uh, now that he is known and we have a profile in CODIS, uh, it is uh, entirely possible that he would uh, show up as, as more evidence is tested and re-examined. Chief, you mentioned that obviously DNA advancements have helped solve this case, close this case, but also that the dedication of some of these detectives and mentioned that some actually returned from retirement. Was that here in Greenville County? In Greenville? Yes, so we have uh, retired detectives, uh, retired detective, retired uh, detective captain, and a retired FBI agent assisting us with our cold case uh, evaluations and investigations. Was he ever a suspect at that time? Uh, when was no, he was on no one's radar. Okay. Could you just kind of further explain um, what went into that initial decision to reach out to this DNA company um, when that was first discussed to, to go that route to see what kind of new technology? So I'm going to let Sergeant Conroy speak to that. Okay. So after talking to the other agencies involved in these cases, we were able to. Um, Memphis had a, a large portion of DNA available, and we were not getting any headway with uh, standard DNA testing. Um, and we made the decision to go out to Parabon to see if they could assist us. Um, just to go down a different avenue of technology is advancement. Do you know, can you explain a little bit of that technology just in layman's terms, how, how that's different, the technology they're using today versus you know some of the attempts prior? Right, um, so Parabon tested our, the DNA that we submitted to them through the genealogy. They used us uh, something called SNPs and our analysts would be more knowledgeable on that. Um, but So they do a, a SNPs DNA profile and then they um, search that through a public data entry website called GEDmatch and we're able to come up with uh, some family members linked to this DNA. Has the Greenville Police Department used this before? No, we have not. This is the first time? This is the first case we've used it. Has Greenville PD, PD had a breakthrough ever before on a cold case using DNA tech? Uh, not using DNA tech uh, technology in my knowledge. Never before. No. So when the DNA shows up, that this has shown up in multiple uh, other cases, is it just like it pops up on a map or does it send you like an email? How do you guys know when... Um, the DNA is across like state lines and stuff like that? When DNA matches in CODIS, um, our labs are notified of a match, and then they notify the investigators. 
and then it shows you where else the DNA has been throughout the country or if if involved throughout the country it will it will show what um, match what agency submitted that DNA that matches ours and we'll reach out to them could you could the department essentially use this uh, same technique for additional cold cases that are still out there yes it's very possible if DNA is available and from the scenes and ultimately and this is kind of for the DNA experts as well but this was solved by family members of this uh, this man willingly donating or giving their DNA samples up. What does that say? Are you encouraging people to kind of take part in this sort of thing? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very, I'm very much so encouraging people to continue to enter their DNA. A question for that. Um, if the family had not consented to give their DNA, would you have subpoenaed it? Like, how does that work if they do not want to participate? We would, we would have used other DNA, um, other investigative techniques. Okay, and then I have a question for the detectives in the original, originally assigned. Um, maybe you just want to speak about what you're feeling now. It's been resolved for so many years. Give us your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the mic. Um, when, they, when I got the call the other day, and it still is very emotional because uh, we never gave up. We put in a lot of hours. We even tried new things back then that weren't being used. And uh, men and women and police service bureau, SLED, everybody kept trying and trying and trying to solve this. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing that this police department never gives up. They have dedicated men and women. They have new leadership here. And it's based on that, that they just kept going. They thought outside the box for Jenny and Philip and their mom. It's just wonderful. That's all I can say. Sir, how does this case compare to the scope of your career in law enforcement? Well, it's one of those cases that you never let go. Uh, you think about things even when you're retired. Uh, all the officers, all the investigators do that. Uh, it's just uh, every victim's important. So you're glad when you get closure on any of those cases. Uh, but this is heartfelt because of the technology that's been used, uh, and it's a new horizon for law enforcement uh, going forward to be able to use DNA the way they are now. What do you tell the other family members of other cold cases that may not be related to this one? Um, what do you tell them? That keep praying, never give up. Support your local law enforcement agency that's doing that. Let them know that you're there. Um, and there's always hope. You know, we had no idea what had happened. We considered that the individual had, was either in prison or was killed. Um, as it turns out, he committed suicide. But just like everybody else, everybody was looking for patterns. Uh, when most of them came here, and, Missouri authorities came here. We were really hoping that, hey, we would get a break and it would get solved that way. But it didn't. It got solved the way it should have been solved. And he was gone and he was not going to hurt anybody else anymore. Not, not knowing who he is and thinking back to the initially bizarre scene and evidence left behind and that sort of thing, do, do you start to, to think back about the initial findings and comparing that to? you know, who you now know is the man behind it? That was one of the first questions I asked uh, about the suspect, because he was not on our radar. Uh, he didn't even live in the apartment complex. Uh, the and so, you know, it was like, why her? You know, why in the middle of the night out of everybody? Because as Philip said, she was, she was a fireball. She took pictures on top of pictures on top of pictures on top of pictures, and she was a big Cleveland Browns fan. Sir. Had a big Cleveland Browns uh, group up here that they watched football on. Uh, 
she was full of life. And somebody took that life. Is there any indication of why, how or why she was targeted, knowing who it is now? Or is that still... And can we expand that to all of the victims? Do we know how he selected these women? Um, we think that since Jenny was so outgoing, her, her apartment is right there by the pool. It wasn't uncommon to have pool parties, and, and Jenny's um, apartment was used to use the restroom. And, um, people going in and out, we, I believe that she was targeted that way um, since she was so outgoing. I don't think it was a random um, act that he just went into that apartment. He knew who was in that apartment when he entered. Um, so, no, I, I believe she was targeted. Do we believe that's the case with the other victims as well? He somehow knew them from something? Uh, yes, because the um, the location of their houses, um, it, you just don't stumble across some of those residents. So I, I do believe they were targeted as well. But not in a way as if they were acquaintances or friends, it more so just that he had seen her because of her presence. In, correct. In and, that, and that's that, that is correct. to them type thing? Um, I don't know if he ran into them anywhere or if he just saw them out, um, followed them home from the grocery store. Um, we know that he um, there's a, a, he had a driver's license seven tenths of a mile from Jenny's apartment. Um, and we are, we're, we're asking that if anybody knows him or recognizes his picture from back then, we would love to build a, a stronger timeline um, to see, to answer some of the questions that we don't have answers to at this moment. Is it frustrating in some ways that, that he is gone and that you can't ask him questions and you can't put him back in jail if you, you know, if he was still here? Yes, I, I think I can speak for everybody. It is frustrating that we can't answer some of the questions, but I think it's very really, really we're relieved that he, we know he did not harm anyone else since 99. I have a question about his end, actually. So the situation four days or what, six days before he dies, was he not arrested or let go of you, but he killed himself with a gun. So is there any more details clarifying that end? So um, when he, he shot himself um, in the hotel room, and he lived for six days in the hospital. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Did you say was it, he had a wife and children in there, or they were? He had a wife, his daughter, and his um, wife's two children were in the room as well. Um, not during the time, not when he committed suicide, but they were removed from the room prior to that. Had his wife known what he had done in the past? We've spoken to her several times. Um, she was not aware of these type of crimes. She was, was aware that he was uh, committing some armed robberies and stuff, but not these type of crimes. Is there a name for her? The wife? Yes. Yes. What's her uh, name? Rosemary Stolz. Can you spell that last name? S-T-O-L-Z. Thanks. I have a question for, for Philip. I mean, after all these years, did you ever, you know, when you started hearing more about DNA testing and things like that, did you ever think in your mind, this could help solve my sister's case? Possibility was always there. Uh, it was just a matter of, of the perseverance and waiting for that technological break. Because we knew that you could only go so far with matching with the tech that was available. And you know, in the past few years, it's been amazing, it, you know, it's been a, a generational leap in what they can do with this. So, just the fact that folks kept at it, kept looking, and were able to work in concert with folks who were the true experts in this field, were able to get it done, connect the dots, build the tree. How did you feel? Uh, were you kept updated along the way over over the years? <clears throat> Every time there was a breakthrough or new information in the case, the folks in the police department always kept us informed, always kept in contact over the years. It had never gone away. <clears throat> they were invested in it, and they kept us informed. How did you feel and react when you got the call, the final call, of this is the guy who did this. Yeah, we didn't know 100% for sure until the exhumation and the final match. And of course, over the course of 28 years, there were some false starts. So, you know, once again, given uh, 
how deeply they went into the investigation of the DNA and coming up with a 99.99% match preliminary to the final determination. Felt pretty good about it. Bill, um, had your mother, uh, I believe she's still alive, uh, have you, is she aware of this? Have you spoken to her about this? Absolutely. Absolutely, I have. How, how is she? Mom is relieved to have found the truth of the case. about the DNA. So in the process of linking it to, I guess, Roger's family, does that require their DNA to already be in the database somehow? Like both prior or else or whatever? I think I understand your question. Um, so we developed the DNA profile from the evidence. And then once we had these new leads this year, we requested or we needed a DNA standard from the family and then from the known individual to compare to that evidence to make that final match. From a prosecution standpoint, when you find a suspect linked with strong DNA who's already dead, how, how, can you explain how it works from here in terms of, you know, do you pursue that? So, so the case uh, is cleared. We cannot arrest the subject. Uh, he cannot be prosecuted. Uh, so it'll be exceptionally clear because he is deceased. That's the term, exceptionally clear. Yeah, there, there are only a few categories of clearances for cases. And uh, you either have an arrest or an exceptionally cleared case. Uh, it's open and active. It's an open case. So, Give, given the, this situation worked with the DNA, do you, does Greenville PD state doing that further in the future for other cold cases? Yeah, so uh, I, I will just tell you that, uh, and, and anybody who knows me knows um, uh, that I, I prefer to take full advantage of the commercial technologies to help us uh, manage our cases and to help prevent crime as well as solve cases where we can. So DNA technology, you know, has emerged from probably the 80s where you needed a root ball in somebody's hair you know, or direct blood uh, stain to work from to uh, touch DNA, and it's and even that has grown in its level of sensitivity. So, so the power of DNA um, to help uh, create um, breakthroughs in cases, particularly with more and more people uh, using the genealogy uh, sites, we can start to begin to narrow a scope and create um, a, a, a general path for an investigation. It can be very, very helpful. In addition, um, uh, Parabon uh, Nano Labs and perhaps others, I don't know, but I'm familiar with Parabon, uh, they're even experimenting uh, with, um, uh, with the DNA profiling to create sketches of what uh, people actually look like. Um, so so there's, uh, there's continued growth in this technology and other technologies that help us. The thing is, is as we as we look to those technologies, we have to reevaluate all our cases. And sometimes we have to reevaluate the evidence. The smudge fingerprint that was, that was not good for the automated fingerprint identification system, RAFIS, may now be good to process for DNA. Um, so we have to reevaluate the evidence in our, in our cold cases because of the changes in technologies. And that's what, uh, and, and our team, our cold case team is here today. Uh, but, but that's what they're currently doing in a number of our cases to try and bring uh, hope and closure. What's the cost to the department to use these third-party uh, companies? Well, I mean, it's not cheap, but, um, you know, really, do you, do you cast a few thousand dollars against closure for a family who wants to know what happened uh, to their family member 28 years ago? That's a lifetime for Jenny. She was 28 when she was killed. And so... Um, really, what, what is that cost? I don't, you know, if it's a few thousand dollars, if it's ten thousand dollars, it brings closure uh, to, a, to a, a pretty vicious, heinous crime. Closure for a family. Uh, closure for our detectives who pour their heart and soul into these cases. And um, closure to our community. So, so the technologies, um, you know, they're expensive as they age, they get cheaper. 
uh, but new technologies come out. It's just it it is what it is. But to me, um, uh, I don't I don't focus on that. I don't focus on the dollar amount. I try and get the case off, and I and I think that's what my team wants to, and our families. Guys, we have time for two more questions. Are you guys continuing to question his wife at the time, Rose Moreno, or is she? You guys don't have any kind of. I. The last time we talked to her was uh, this Tuesday, um, and we do anticipate speaking with her again. Um, as, as more information comes in. Last question. Do we know how long they, they were married? Was it the duration of some of these crimes? Um, we have not been able to confirm that they were married. She said they married um, after the burglary of um, the young individual in Fort Gold, or Fort Gold. Um, she said they married so she would not have to testify, but we were unable to confirm the date of their marriage at this point. And I'm sorry, where does she reside now? Huntsville, Alabama. Alabama. 